Okay, let's bow our heads as we prepare for the teaching of God's Word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity that we have to gather together as like-minded believers. I pray, Father, that you might continue to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I pray that each and every believer might realize what their spiritual gifts are and use those for the body of Christ. Sanctify us through your truth because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your handout uh, on spiritual gifts, you can turn to page three, the third page of that handout. And uh, this week we'll be dealing with permanent spiritual gifts. Permanent spiritual gifts. <clears throat> At the point of faith alone in Christ alone, God gives every born again a believer a spiritual gift. And we dealt with the temporal spiritual gifts. Now we're going to deal with those that remain throughout the church age. The permanent spiritual gifts are the gift of pastor teacher, which is under the category of leadership. Leadership. It could also fall under speaking as well. That's kind of a dual category. But I separated the speaking gifts uh, in a separate category. The speaking gifts, evangelists, teachers, and exhortation. And then the service gifts, the gift of helps, mercy, giving, and administration. But think about those gifts on those, that page. You have one of them if you're a believer in Christ. Think about that. So every believer has at least one or more spiritual gifts given. Now let's talk about the gift of pastor teacher. We're going to begin with that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 is a key passage on this particular spiritual gift, although I have several verses uh, mentioning the gift of pastor teacher in the New Testament. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.11 And he gave, he himself gave, and this is given by Christ, by the way, who is, verse 10, the one who has ascended far above all the heavens. So it shows you, by the way, that these spiritual gifts were not given before Christ ascended. So the gift of pastor teacher is not an Old Testament gift. It's a New Testament church age spiritual gift. And so this gift is not given before Christ ascended. And it's given to the church for the benefit of the church. And therefore he gave some to be apostles and some prophets. As we saw in Ephesians 2.20, the apostles and prophets are for the foundation of the church. That's a temporal spiritual gift. And then those, the gift for the numerical growth of the church, which we'll deal with later, the gift of evangelist, evangelist. And then for the spiritual growth of the church, we have the fourth gift mentioned, the pastor teacher, one office there, the pastor teacher, poimen didaskalos. So the pastor teacher is the definition as you look at your handout, this is the, I think, a good definition of the office of pastor teacher. Pastor teacher is one who has oversight of a local flock. There's other pastors that also call him an overseer. So the episcopos, the idea of having the oversight of the flock. And therefore authority. Pastor has God-given authority. And with that authority comes accountability. And this verse is indicating that the pastor teacher will be held account to having, having taught accurate doctrine and how he has, you know, protected and guided and nurtured the sheep. So there is accountability. The pastor is accountable to God. So he has authority and accountability to shepherd the sheep through consistent and accurate teaching. Notice how he shepherds and teach the, the sheep. He shepherds them through the teaching of the Word of God. He doesn't shepherd them through visiting everyone, although he can do that from time to time, but that's the main shepherding ministry is the, the feeding the sheep. Feeding the sheep. Uh, and then he says, the definition continues. So let me start over here. One who has oversight of a local flock and therefore authority with accountability to shepherd the sheep through consistent and accurate teaching for the purpose of spiritual growth and maturity of the sheep. 
And we have here spiritual growth and maturity in verse 13 of Ephesians 4. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, this is not interdenominational unity. This is unity within the local assembly. Okay. And unity of the faith, consistency, and accurate doctrine. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a teleos, perfect. The word means mature. Mature. This adjective speaks of the believer who is not sinless perfect. He's not talking about sinless perfection. No one will ever reach that goal, but a believer who is mature in the faith. So that's the goal of the gift of pastor teacher, equipping the saints so they eventually grow to spiritual maturity. And what does that look like? Christ likeness, verse 13, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That simply means Christ likeness. So the goal there is simply teaching the word of God to cause spiritual growth. And we know that 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, um, we've always quoted this passage here. Uh, we, we know that it's, we grow through the teaching of scripture. Notice in um, verse 16, Peter warns here, mentions about Paul's epistles. And he says, also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Are there some difficult truth in the Pauline epistles? Of course. Does that mean that we should skip over those difficult things? No. Those things are to be communicated. But it's uh, individuals that are unstable that twist those teachings of Paul, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. By the way, it shows that Paul's letters are called scripture. It's very important. Paul's letters are called scripture. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Believers can easily slip and fall away from their spiritual progress by being what? Led away with the air of the wicked. In order to avoid that, what do we do? We grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So consistent, accurate grace teaching is very important for the pastor teacher. So let's go back to our passage here then, Ephesians 4. So these, the pastor teacher has the job of equipping the saints. And the equipping the saints means through the consistent teaching of the Word of God, the saints discover what their spiritual gift is. Part of that equipping is understanding your purpose in the body of Christ, and therefore ministering to those saints so that they could discover their spiritual gift, derive the spiritual strength, and then they could do the work of the ministry. He didn't call the pastor to do the work of the ministry, the pastor simply equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. A lot of churches have it backwards. They think the pastor is like a chicken with his head cut off doing everything else. But his job is to study and teach. His job is to focus on the word of God so that saints and believers can visit those in the hospital, minister, encourage, help, teach, and so forth. So he equips the saints for the work of the ministry. What happens when that occurs? The body of Christ is built up. Edifying the body of Christ. When this order, biblical order, is emphasized in the local assembly, the number one goal of the pastor is to teach. That's why he's called a shepherd teacher. That is his office, the shepherd teacher. And this is how believers grow. He's not simply an administrator or uh, you know, a successful businessman and manager. He is a teacher at the core of his office and duty. And therefore, if he's not a teacher, he should not be in the ministry, or at least he should not be in the pastorate. If he has no ability, not apt to teach, by the way, is one of the qualifications of the pastor teacher in 1 Timothy 3, apt to teach. And if he's not apt to teach, therefore he should not be in the ministry, no matter how kind and compassionate he is, 
maybe as a gift of encouragement. And there's other pastors who are very evangelistic. Maybe that guy has the gift of evangelism instead of being a pastor teacher. And therefore, you know, because of your messages, you'll hear all you hear every week is, and the whole sermon is evangelism, leading people to Christ. But once they are born again, then what? <laughs> then what do you do with them? And so that individual probably should think twice, maybe I'm more gifted toward evangelism. And, uh, you know, God, the church needs gifted evangelists. Now, let's take a look here uh, then at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. <clears throat> Notice in these three, uh, these two verses, we have three terms for the pastor, right? He's called an elder. And elder means an uh, older individual, mature in the faith. That's the idea of an elder. And uh, the uh, Jewish uh, Sanhedrin had older individuals who were mature. And the, the pattern here is qualified elders to lead the flock. Now, it doesn't mean that they always have to be plural in the church. Uh, there could be one elder in the church, as in 1 Timothy 3. We do have in Revelation 2 and 3 would be another, another passage, one angelos per church. But I think it depends on the size of the congregation. Obviously, when duties, uh, there's more people, then there's a need to call on elders in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, Duluth Bible Church, they have, what, 400? And they have three elders. Three. And the problem is, you get too many elders, you have people that are not on board, then you start to have some real problems in the church, you know, and therefore, um, that could be an issue. But elder can be singular or plural. I think both are taught in the Word of God. So the elders, uh, he says, they're called elders. Notice they're called shepherds. In verse 2, the shepherd, the flock, and they're called overseers. So three terms here, they're the same office. Elder, shepherd, overseer. Each one emphasizes a different aspect of the pastoral ministry. Elders, older individuals who are mature in the faith. <clears throat> Shepherds, one who protects the flock, guides the flock, feeds the flock. That's the shepherd's job. And an overseer means accountability and responsibility. And also he looks out for the wolves coming in. We'll see this term used in Acts uh, 20 to look out over the flock and see if there's any false teachers coming from the outside or growing from within. So there's internal uh, teachers that would lead people away from the truth. He has to guard the flock. So he, his office is protective. He has to look out over and see needs in the flock. He has to be aware of people and their situation, their needs, spiritually speaking, where people are spiritually, so he can minister to those individuals. Um, and so he has to keep all that in mind. So it's being a pastor, let me tell you, is totally different from being a seminary professor or just a teacher and I, I could have went both, both directions in my ministry. And I was called at one point to be a seminary president, but I turned that down uh, early on. And I'm like, you know, mainly you'll be involved in min administration and organization. I have, a business, I have a business degree, but still, that's not where my heart is. Um, or even teaching in, in a seminary. Uh, done that. But... Uh, I feel more fulfilled teaching as a pastor. It's a gift, and I realize that that's my gift. That's my niche, that, that is where God has called me. And the church needs people that understand systematic theology, the biblical languages, they, uh, to understand the needs of individuals, the balance there, and therefore uh, gifted men are very important for the benefit of the body of Christ. God ordained the local church, and the local church is the pillar and support beam for the truth. The local church is, not parachurch, 
parachurch ministries come alongside, or para means alongside in the Greek. And supposedly they support the church, but many times they attack the church. I was reading an article today by a parachurch ministry that was attacking the church. And I just kind of laughed. This person, particular person doesn't know anything about church policy. And they're out there from the outside, probably even not even a member of a local church, being in a parachurch ministry. And they're always attacking the church. A lot of them, and not all of them, but some of the ministries are attacking, and that's not right. So here, uh, let's take a look at the passage, and we'll read it. Verse 1, the elders who are among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So we are to shepherd through teaching. We are to shepherd through feeding the, feeding the sheep, nurturing the sheep. Uh, and then he says, serving as overseers. Overseers. Those who have accountability, those who look out for the needs of the flock, those who protect the flock as part of the overseeing duty. And you do this not because you have to, not by compulsion. Well, that's what the church wants me to do, so I gotta have to do that, whether I feel like it or not. Well, some days you don't feel entirely uh, fit, but you still have a duty, certainly, but this is the idea of always saying, well, you know, those people really don't want to do that. Well, what if, if you wake up every week and you have that attitude, maybe you shouldn't do be doing what you're doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe you should be doing something else. Well, this is what God called me, so I just have to do it, you know. Well, no, there should be joy in service. There should be joy. It's not because someone twists in your arm, but willingly. And it's not because you want to you know, fleece the sheep. <laughs> you want to feed the sheep, right? Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And then not being a spiritual bully. Now being lords means there was a shepherding movement in the 70s, which was actually a cult. And they would go to people's homes and say, what were you watching on TV last night? And they were, what books do you have there? And they were going and really personal, private stuff. They were you know, controlling, that's what cults do. And uh, there was one particular individual that got burned out of that, in that ministry, and they said that, well, I don't need a, I don't, you know, Bible doesn't call pastors, uh, you know, there's no, no such need for, for that. Every person's independent and autonomous. I said, nope, no, sir. You go from one extreme to the other, see. Yeah, those individuals were spiritual bullies. And you get people that write books about how the church abused them. Okay. What about all those faithful ministers that have laid down their life, have ministered and served, and have really helped people come to know Christ and have grown in grace? What about those individuals? See, we go from one extreme to the other. He says here, you have accountability, but it's not as a spiritual bully. You don't dominate the flock. You're an example to the flock. And so you're not there as lords demanding absolute obedience. And there's certain things, by the way, you know, the Bible warns a young pastor, Timothy, to avoid endless disputes and controversies. There's certain things that you just don't dive into. And you don't address every single little problem. <laughs> you address the big issues. You know, there are certain things you need to let go and say, well, that person just needs to grow. I'm going to keep teaching the Word of God. I don't need to hammer them. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let them grow. Now, don't get me wrong. A pastor is not to be passive. He has to be able to face tough issues. And even when people are not agreeing with him, if it's scriptural, he has to address those issues. But he is mainly to be an example to the flock. And then when he does, when he's an example to the flock, the chief shepherd, notice the chief shepherd, which also shows that the chef, pastor teacher is an under shepherd. Now in those days they had, you know, people who were in charge of, these chief shepherds were in charge of multiple <laughs> flocks and they assigned under shepherds underneath them. And he used that example in the illustration of the ultimate shepherd of the sheep is Christ. 
It's his church, by the way. So Free Grace Bible Church is not my church, although I use that terminology from time to time when talking about pastors because you feel an attachment to people. But it's really the Lord's church. Upon the rock, this rock, I will build my church, my church. And I'm accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm accountable to the chief shepherd. And I've faithfully administered my duty when, the, then when he appears, there's a pastor's crown. Many of you have called this crown of glory the pastor's crown. One of the rewards that God will give faithful ministers uh, to, of the word of God. Now notice verse five, we don't need to stop there because there's accountability, responsibility for those under the care of that overseer. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. So there's submission to those mature, older individuals who are leading the local assembly. There must be, and that's accountability. Submit to your elders. And always be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, let's take a look at the book of Acts, Acts 20, verses 28 through 30. And what would I, I would call this the first pastor's conference. Just attended one down in Houston. That was awesome. Enjoy meeting other fellow pastors and servants and missionaries. Um, but this was a gathering of elders at Ephesus. <clears throat> and he says here, um, I think it was here at Ephesus, but he says here in verse 28, 27, uh, the first duty of the overseer is to declare the whole counsel of God. Paul did that to these Ephesian elders. And I think that was an example of what they should do. For I'm not shunned or held back to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now, what is that? I think at least all the areas of systematic theology, all the major areas of doctrine. By the way, if you teach verse by verse, there are certain truths and principles that are repeated. And the Bible designed it that way. There are certain truths you run across again and again and again. And uh, therefore, all the areas of systematic theology. Now, at least I have a goal in my ministry long term to teach you the whole Bible, verse by verse. But I don't know if that, I don't have to live another 50 years with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to happen. But uh, so far, we have dealt with in the past 20 some years, I taught through almost all the New Testament books of the Bible, except, I think, Mark and um, Luke and John. So I taught Matthew, verse by verse, Romans. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, I taught all the Pauline epistles. Book taught book of Revelation, verse by verse. Old Testament, we're working through Jeremiah. We're almost taught Jeremiah, taught Isaiah. Uh, so at least a major amount of prophets. But uh, you know, that's that's over a course of a lifetime. The whole counsel of God, though, the whole counsel of God is important. Then there, verse 28, therefore. Take heed to yourself. As a pastor, teacher, you have, you have to guard your own spiritual life. And Satan is always attacking the leader. Believe me, it's, he's always attacking and some kind of attack. And uh, you have to guard your own walk with the Lord. You always have to be on guard. And sometimes it blindsides you. Boom, a mood, an attitude, a temptation, just boom. It'll hit you and you say, this is really not uh, from human origin. It might be people saying X, Y, and Z. But he said, this is really from Satan. Remember what Jesus said to Peter. Far be it from you to go to cross, even well-meaning things. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay. Uh, so you always have to guard your own spiritual life. Paul told Timothy that as well. Take it, take it to yourself. If you're going to be an example to the flock, you have to guard your own spiritual life. And there's some pastors that may know a lot of Bible, but if they don't do that, then the ministry fails. And then they deviate into false teaching. So you, you say, well, how can these people that know so much truth, you know, go into false teaching? All I've always said is one word, S-I-N, sin. 
there's a problem there with their walk with the Lord. That's the root issue, isn't it, really? The root issue is there's a problem with their walk with the Lord somewhere. Something's not right. Because the Lord's not going to lead you into false doctrine if you're positive. <laughs> now, <clears throat> take heed to yourself and to all the flock. You have walked, you know, protect the flock. Among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice, you don't choose your ministry. Now, you may sign up with a particular local assembly or identify with one church. They may call you, but the gift itself is given by the Holy Spirit. So that spiritual gift is given at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. And that would align with 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit administers the gifts in the church. <clears throat> so he says, Take heed yourself unto all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd. Notice the two words that we saw in 1 Peter are mentioned here. The episcopos, the overseer, and the... Uh, Point may not point may know in the Greek here shepherd. So shepherd the church with he which he purchased with his own blood. He purchased through his death the church. Uh, he bought the church through his redemption. For I know this that after my departure, what will happen? Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Wolves attack sheep. Satan has his emissaries that attack weak sheep. And I've always stated that Satan attacks those who are loosely connected to the flock. See, if you're not right there, you're on the outside, Satan goes for those sheep straggling, one going astray. If you're going astray, spiritually speaking, Satan attacks. And so he says here that there'll be those who will speak or there'll be savage wolves not sparing the flock. These are evil, false teachers. Mm. Also, notice the threat from without, the threat from within. Also, among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, I find it interesting, this Greek word, draw away. <clears throat> I have it up here on the screen. And it's spelled uh, apo, S P A O, and this Greek word means to draw away the disciples after them, and therefore alienate them. This is very important. So they want to take an individual and alienate them from their pastor, right? Alienate them from other sheep. This is where quick start, by the way, alienation. There's a lot of insight into that. These individuals want to alienate people. Let's just have our own little thing over here, independent of the church. We don't need a church's blessing. We can do it ourselves. You know, we don't need to be with those people. It's just our little group, you know. And exclusivity and alienation. And they're doing it so that they'll follow them instead of the pastor, teacher, or the Lord Jesus Christ. So these disciples will rise among the local assembly and speak contrary things, meaning they're contrary, misleading to what the pastor is teaching. Oh, that's really not right. Let's be doing our home here, you know, Bill, and I'll really tell you how what what the true way is, you know. And it's not like they're you know seeing false doctrine and they want to identify with the pastor who teaches sound doctrine. But uh, they want simply the people to follow them instead of Christ. So that's a danger, the danger from without and from within. <clears throat> and growing up, I saw this second illustration. There was one guy who would always corner me. And he'd get me in a clip, and he knows who this is. He would always ask, well, what do we think about that? And that, and that, and that, and that. And it's like, I was young believers, and really, I never really thought about that, you know. And he was always corner, and, and people, he was, he was, he was bad-mouthing his pastor. He was drawing these young believers away. And by the way, he eventually left the church. Doing his own little thing. His own little ministry, so-called. And so you have to always be careful about, you know, the dangers from without and dangers from within. Therefore, what's the idea? Watch. What do you watch? 
That's the idea. He means a pastor needs to be aware of these things. A pastor needs to be aware. And I, I can tell you, I am aware when people are growing, when people are starting to drift, when people are becoming indifferent to the teaching of the Word of God, when people have checked out, not physically, but mentally, in the local assembly, I know something is wrong. I said, something's not right here. I've seen people, and then six months later, they're gone. And for, and I, I know, I said, they're not walking with the Lord. They're not, they're not. There's something as, there's a bird in your saddle, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Instead of dealing with the issue, forgiveness, maybe there's unforgiveness in the body of Christ. And it's affect their, it affects their learning doctrine. And uh, so therefore, you have to watch out for these things. And notice the emotion of the pastor, emotion of Paul. Remember that for three years, I did not cease. Three years to warn. He warned about these. And so he admonished and instructed. The word warn means the counsel about avoidance or cessation of an improper course of conduct to admonish. Day and night with what? Tears. You know, tears. You're concerned about people many times that comes out in the ministry. You know, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And uh, sometimes you can't help it when you feel for people that should be walking the truth and they're drifting. And you warn them and warn them and they don't listen. Just like a parent that sees, that sees their children not walking in truth. It grieves you. And therefore, it should grieve the communicator of people who are not following the Lord. And you know what? Is, what builds a believer up? Another part of the ministry, grace teaching. Verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Sanctification occurs not by legalism, but by grace orientation, grace teaching. And that brings what? Rewards. And give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So grace teaching, watching, warning, watching for enemies from without, within, um, teaching the whole counsel of God. This is good advice for the pastor teacher. Now let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 22. And I don't have that in the notes here, but... You can add that passage. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. <coughs> we urge you, brother, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Notice here, there are the individuals that are over you in the Lord. These are the elders of the pastor teacher. Uh, he has responsibility and those who admonish you. What are you to do? Recognize those who labor in word and doctrine, right? And then esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And then be at peace among themselves. That's one of the greatest blessings you can give to any pastor teacher. Harmony, not infighting. Peace. And therefore, he so exhorts the brother, and exhort you, brother. Now, this is for the believers. The believers are to, several things, warn those who are unruly, those who are insubordinate or idle, are not using their spiritual gifts, are not following the Lord, comfort the faint-hearted, there are those who are troubled with whatever their physical issues it could be, or spiritual issues, problems at work. We are to bring comfort to those who are even not strong spiritually, the weaker believer we could call him. Uphold the weak, support those who are weak in the faith, and don't say, you don't have enough doctrine, why shouldn't you do that? Just apply this passage, and <laughs> like a computer. Here's four verses for you, walk away, you know. Well, sometimes we should give the word of God, saying, hey, you remind, remind them of God's promises and so forth, but you know, sometimes we're impatient. And if you think about yourself as a young believer, were there those who were patient with you? I'm sure. So should we be patient with others? 
or be absolutely demanding. Uh, and that's for the believer here. Now, I like this, um, don't render evil for evil, but pursue what is good for both yourselves and for what? And notice here, for all. So again, we're all in the body together. This is not do your own thing. This is all for the benefit of each other. You know, the three musketeers, all for one, one for all. And that's really what the body of Christ should be. We're here to help each other. Uh, it's for the benefit of other believers. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. These are pithy commands. Abstain from every form of evil. Now I want to read you a quote here from uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I want to try to pull that up here. And there's a link here to 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And I'll try to pull this up with the full menu here. And increase the font. We'll bring this up here. Okay. <clears throat> All Christians have four ongoing and continuous responsibilities to one another. The idol needs to be worn. Can you read that back there? Sure. A little larger, maybe? Yeah. Okay, let's just do it a little bit. Okay. Um, the idol need to be worn. Those who neglect their daily duties need to be stirred up to action. The timid, short of soul, literally, needs encouragement. Those faint-hearted people tend to become discouraged and despondent more easily than most. You know individuals like that? They need cheering up, stimulation to press on, and extra help to live the Christian life. Interesting, the verbs in these two commands are in the same order as the first two participles. The weak, see, need help. These have not yet learned to lean on the Lord as much as they should for their spiritual needs. Until they do, they need strong support from other believers. Of course, all Christians are weak and need the strength that comes from Christian fellowship. But the spiritual weak need it more than most. And then the fourth responsibility here summarizes the preceding three. Be patient with everyone. While other Christians are the primary focus of patience in this context, this charge is general enough to include all people. This ability to help others who are in some respect not as strong as oneself requires nothing short of the love of God produced by the Holy Spirit. And that's a great summary of the fellow believer's responsibility toward each other. Okay, let's continue in Hebrews 13 verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. <clears throat> the Bible exhorts to remember those who rule over you. Now notice here again, there's, the word rule over comes from a Greek word means to lead the way, to go first. So you have a leader who says, this is the direction we should be going. And so he heads out, and then there are others that follow him. Just like a shepherd that leads you beside still waters, you know, restores your soul, leads you in the path of righteousness. So the idea of the pastor teacher is one who leads the way. That's part of rulership. He leads the way of the way the local assembly should go or the individual believer. And he does that through the teaching of Scripture. Notice, who has spoken the word of God to you. No, notice, who have spoken, we have an aorist tense. We have an aorist active indicative verb, meaning in the past has spoken. Whose faith follow, imitate their spiritual life considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, I could be referring, referring here to past pastors, even those who have passed on. I think there's a distinction between those who have helped you benefit, benefit you spiritually as a young believer and those who are benefiting you now. He mentions both, by the way. 
because he says those who rule over you current uh, in the past who have spoken, and then it goes down to verse, let's take a look at verse 17. Obey those who rule over you now and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. So verse 17 is in contrast to those who in the past have spoken the word of God. They rule over you in the past, those pastors, verse 17, there are those who rule over you in the present. See that? Same Greek word there for rule over, lead the way now. Think about Moses and Joshua. God's purpose for Moses was to deliver the children of Israel from bondage after 400 years. Lead them through the wilderness, and then it was Joshua's job to lead them into the promised land. See, it actually was the next generation that he did so. So the baton was passed off. Moses fulfilled his purpose, and then Joshua came along, and then he had a purpose as well. Sometimes we get stuck in the past, and we say, you know, well, I remember so-and-so and that, and, you know, it can never be any different. Wish it was that way. Like, God's always raising up new leaders in the church. So we always want to be stuck in the past all the time. We have to think about the present. We got to go forward. Remember what he told the children of Israel after Moses died? Moses, my servant, is dead. <laughs> always think about that. Moses, my servant, is dead. Uh, remember J. Vernon McGee when he was a young believer? And he was given a church before he became well known, you know. He eventually left that church, but he then he he would tour the South and he was an evangelist too. He had an evangelistic series of meetings in the South, and one old guy came to Matcher Church and said, Well, I know you had a great service tonight, and there's, you know, something like ten people came to know the Lord. And he said, Yeah, but I remember you know, years ago, this preacher came in, there's 30 people that came to Christ, and I was like, instead of appreciating what God was doing then, the guy was always living in the past. Uh, the old guy syndrome is better in the past. <laughs> Let's not get the old guy syndrome when it comes to church. We can always say, well, I, I can give you stories about growing up and, you know, going to Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall, and 900 people were there, and Hearing the Book of Romans taught the first time in my life, verse by verse, exegetically, it's like, wow, this is great. But, you know, I'm not there. I'm not in Pittsburgh. I'm here in Dallas for a reason. So there are those in the past who so hell, I thank God for those who invested in me. I mentioned those pastor teachers who have played a great role in my life, but God has something for us in the present. Obey those who rule over you now. Be submissive. For they do what? Here's the accountability. They watch out for your souls. They're looking out and they're protecting you. They're protecting you. They want to make sure that you're growing in the Lord. <clears throat> so again, it's a protective ministry and there's accountability in that. This won't happen if you're not part of a local assembly. How can a pastor watch out for your soul if he doesn't know you? It doesn't know your needs. And notice here, as those who must give what? An account. So I'm accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to protect the sheep from false teaching. And that includes who I call into the pulpit as well. And you have to make sure the person is not uh, teaching false doctrine and leading the people astray. Let them do so with joy, meaning one at the judgment seat of Christ, the pastor teacher will give them a report. How have you done in your ministry? And you think, oh, I did okay here, but oh, there are those people over there. Oh. <laughs> he said, let them do with joy. Let them give a report, not with grief, for that will not be beneficial for you. So at the Bema seat of Christ, the pastor teacher must give a good report. <coughs> He wants to give a good report with those who have uh, listened to the teaching ministry of the Word of God. Okay, let's take a look here. Uh, I want to show you here verse, um, again, verse 9. The heart is established by grace, not legalism. 
Once again, grace teaching is part and parcel of the overseer's ministry. Now, let's look at, look at 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. Here he gives the qualifications of the overseer. And remember, you know, Dr. Couch was going through this passage. And he has some helpful advice in this. And I have his words. I found that his, his uh, book on the church. I have two um, quotes here about this passage and these qualifications I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to read here. Let me see if I can pull this up here. One was by, the second one's by Dr. Couch, the first is by John Piper. Now, I don't agree with John Piper and his Lordship Salvation, but I think this quote, particular quote is good here. I don't think the point of those stipulations in 1 Timothy and Titus is to lead to a quick re resignation of pastors, but to discern whether a pap man has maturity and a giftedness to lead a well-ordered family. It's kind of a guideline forwarded it for a local assembly to choose a pastor teacher. Now, Dr. Cobb says this, Among with the importance of, Paul, of noting Paul's use of the present tense, several vital mistakes are made when examining the apostles' list of qualifications. The first is to presume a man has had a perfect sinless past. <laughs> no one has had it, including the pastor. <laughs> Also, to believe that a prospect for elder pastor perfectly fits all the, re all the requirements is not realistic and does not comply with the facts. No one can come up to the standards laid down by Paul. Nevertheless, they are high biblical ideals which no one can question. Without doubt, as this remains as important goals. But too often, here's the problem, too often they have been used against godly men who will indeed walk with imperfections. The list can be turned into weapons of legalism to judge, condemn, and remove men who need to be corrected but not necessarily replaced. And I think these commands have been used in the past too harshly. And I can give you an example, but you probably know the individual. I won't give their name, but individuals in the past who have ran pastors off. I know one pastor in particular, grace, grace guy, individuals. He had one issue, but this particular individual ran him off. He went down the road of ministry after 20 years, and he could easily have been restored. And because this pastor was used too harsh against that particular man, and even Pastor, uh, or Dr. Couch says, when we look at uh, husband and one wife, some say, we can't be a pastor if you had a divorce in the past, you've been divorced. And he says, no, they're all present tense. Say that was 10, 20 years ago. And right now he's married to a faithful wife at this time. So the present tense verb there, at this time. So that's very important. Um, Let's take a look at this then. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires a posi posi position of an overseer, bishop is not the guy with a pointy hat, uh, simply an overseer, he desires a good work. A bishop, this must be blameless. The husband, I think any legal blame as far as criminal records, make sure he's not uh, you know, a murderer or a thief or second story man, so to speak. He make sure he's far as on the outside. I think blameless refers to those on the outside. When we look at verse 7, notice here, he must have a good testimony of those who are outside. If there's people in the community that knows, hey, this guy was a criminal, this guy was, you know, X, Y, and Z, it wouldn't be a good idea to call that guy as an overseer. Blameless, the husband of one wife, that literally means a one woman kind of man. I mean, if he's married now, he's committed. He's faithful to that woman. Doesn't mean that he's never, never had a divorce. Because the present tense. Is he committed now? Is he faithful now? Or is he, or is he a womanizer? You know, self-controlled, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, 
apt to teach. Notice, able to teach. There's one of the qualifications. Not given to wine, meaning he's, you know, it's funny. In the same book, he tells, tells Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Medicinal purposes. <laughs> but you're not to be a drunkard. Obviously, you don't call a drunkard in the ministry. He's not to settle things with his fist. <laughs> He's not violent or a brawler. He's not greedy just to get the money. In, in the ministry for the money. He's gentle, not argumentative, quarrelsome. He's not covetous. He's, and then one who rules his own house well, having his children's submission with all respect. For a man does not know how to rule his own house. How will he take care of the church of God? So those children, young children, are to be respectful. That doesn't mean they'll always line up perfectly with the way you want them to line up, but they should be respectful. And then he says, not a new convert. Novice means a new believer. Why? Because he'll be arrogant. He thinks he knows everything about the ministry. He just came out of seminary. No, I know it all. Not necessarily. If you're a new believer, by the way, you need training first and foremost. Training in the biblical languages, training in systematic theology, and so forth. So there must be a period of time between the giving of the gift and the using of the gift uh, for the pastor teacher. It, he is unique in that sense. <clears throat> He's not to be a new believer, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall in the same condemnation as Satan. And then having a good testimony among those who are out, outside, he would not want to bring disrepute to the church from the community that knows him. And that's the idea. So deacons are given with some of the same similar qualifications, by the way, too. We won't look at that uh, today. But the there's 14, actually. When you compare this passage and Titus, there's 14 qualifications, or guide, called guidelines. Guidelines for calling a pastor as far as moral character, spiritual guidelines. All right, let's take a look at uh, the book of Titus then. Titus 1, 5 through 9. Notice here that the appointing of elders is in every city. <clears throat> so these are the foundation of churches. These are individuals. So he's not leaving these people without oversight. These are not believers that are just kind of on their own and just kind of meeting together for coffee and whatever. Uh, these are believers that are plugged into someone who will lead them, teach them, and guide them. He says, do this in every city. Every city. And that's on the Isle of Crete. So the, what we call super missionaries, they went out and pioneered new fields. And then those pioneers, such as Titus, would then appoint pastors or overseers or elders in every city, as Paul, the apostle, commanded them. So for this reason, I left you in Crete, you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And then he has, given the qualifications here, blameless, some of the same in 1 Timothy, husband and wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. And then the steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy, hospitable, lover of good, Sober-minded, holy, just, self, under self-control. Holding fast a faithful word, as he has been taught, that he might be able by sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, to exhort and convince those who contradict. Again, the teaching ministry uh, is prominent in his duties. Now, let's take a look at an example of Timothy, and then we'll close there. The example of the spiritual gift, the pastor teacher, would be Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy about false teachers in the last days. By the way, verses 1 through 5, we have here 
that some in the last days will be depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, dogs from demons, forbidding the married. I always said that this verse three sounds like the Roman Catholic Church. You know, the priest can't marry. Oh yeah, that's going to be helpful in this uh, service. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, then he says these false teachings, these ascetic and legalistic teachings will drift into the church. Now he says, but if you tell believers about these false doctrines, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and a sound doctrine, which you have carefully followed. By the way, the word sound or good has the idea of healthy. Is there doctrine that's bad for your health? Yes, <laughs> false teaching, false teaching. And so, he says, instruct the believers in these things. Timothy then would be a pastor teacher. Verses 12 through 15, he says, no, let no one despise your youth. Now let's, let's contrast that with being a novice. A novice means a new believer, but Timothy wasn't a new believer. He could still be young. He could still be young and trained, but that doesn't contradict what Paul said earlier, okay? You have someone in their 20s who has, who has gone through seminary or at least has been trained by other, another pastor and they're ready to begin their ministry. And he gives advice on how to deal with older individuals in the congregation, you know. And therefore, he says, don't let no one look down on your youth, belittle you because you're young. Here's how you gain respect, be an example. Once again, you're an example to older individuals who've been around longer than you, but still need to listen to what you have to say. Be an example to the believers in word, your teaching, the way you comport yourself, conduct, your love, your spirit, your faith, your purity. Till I come, get attention to reading. This is a public reading of scripture, by the way. Just read it. And then expound on it and teach it. Reading, exhortation, teaching. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. All right, let's stop right there, and uh, we'll continue <coughs> with the gift of evangelists next time we're together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gifts you've given to the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for the gift of pastor, teacher, and the importance of this office. I pray that you might help me, Father, to soberly realize the accountability and responsibility that I have for those entrusted under my care. Father, bless these believers. I pray that I might truly be an example to them of Christ's likeness and godliness and sound teaching. Father, just be with our body, continue to bless it, help us to grow in your grace, and we ask these things in Christ's name, amen.